custom of lighting things, trees especially, that this season goes back to cavemen. And around the 25th, around the 21st of December, the days are getting long, shorter and shorter and shorter. And they were frightened that the sun god was leaving them and the sun was going out. And so they practiced what was the most prevalent form of primitive religion, which is called sympathetic magic. Uh, at one point during the Indian rain dance, water will be poured on the ground to give the great spirit the idea to do the same thing in a large way, send rain. So if you want the sun god to shine again, you create a bonfire, and they would collect trees and pile them up in front of them and light it. Light the trees, and this would be, the that was the beginning of the idea of lighting trees, trees of light. And you see two versions of trees of light in front of you. It's interesting that the two holidays of the season, Hanukkah and Christmas, are totally unrelated in terms of theme, but that the symbol, willy-nilly, in the last hundred years has become the same symbol. The menorah on the right is clearly an abstract tree of light, and as it was the great gold menorah that stood in the temple uh, in Jerusalem, which was overrun by the pagans in 165 BC, they turned it into a pagan temple, and the Jewish revolutionaries fought against the Seleucid Greeks, conquered Jerusalem, or liberated Jerusalem, and then rededicated the temple. Hanukkah means rededication. And they relighted the great menorah, which had been allowed to go out. That was always burning, was always burning in the temple of Jerusalem. It goes back to Moses, that particular cult object, the seven branch candlestick, to represent the growing light of God spreading around the world. So that's the symbol of Hanukkah, and that goes back to 165 BC. And actually, it goes back to Moses in 1250 BC. Christmas tree is more recent, but it begins with the cavemen right, uh, making those bonfires of trees to get the sun god to return at the darkest time of the year. We light trees when we need the light most, as the days are getting shorter and shorter. And it always works. The sun god gets the idea, and the days begin getting longer. You thought that was just a coincidence, but it's because of all these trees of light. Now, the Norse worshipped their own gods, and they had a celebration called Yule from December 21st until January. Twelve days of feasting and reveling, and they would bring in a log, an enormous log, and light it, and it would burn for twelve days, and while it burned, they would have this ongoing feast. In Germany, they worshipped Odin. The god Odin would fly through the sky to check on his people and determine their fates. So you see the origin of the Christmas tree, the Yule log, and Santa Claus going across the heavens. In Rome, you had the Saturnalia, and that was in honor of Saturn, the agriculture god. And it was during the month of the winter solstice. You would eat and drink and be merry. And slaves and masters would reverse roles. The slaves would take over the plantation or the manor house for that month. And the peasants would run the city, and people would give gifts, and there would be great feasting. You have one Christian hymn, Masters in this Hall, and it says, For today our poor folk raise it up and cast it down the proud. And that's uh, happening in Zuccotti Park, and it also happens uh, with Christmas. The idea is you reverse roles, and God's poor take over the city. The Romans celebrated Saturnalia, but they also celebrated Juvenalia at the same time, and this was a holiday honoring children. The upper class Romans celebrated the birthday of Mithra on December 25th, the god of the unconquerable sun. And again, the idea was that although the sun is fading, Mithra, the sun god, would soon come back, and they were encouraging him to do that, and they also lit bonfires. Now, how did this become Christianized? In 354 A.D., for the first time, Christmas is mentioned in a compendium of Christian observances in Rome. Christians took over both Juvenalia and Saturnalia in order to win the peasantry over for the new religion. Pope Julius I said that December 25th was the day of Jesus' birth, although everybody knew that the shepherds would not be out in the 
kills of Judea around uh, Bethlehem on December 25th. They and the sheep would both starve to death, uh, would freeze to death. But so Jesus probably was born in the spring. But they took this over because it was the birthday of Mithras, the center of Juvenalia and Saturnalia, and probably won a lot of converts that way. That was the way Christianity spread. And it was considered a holiday of eating and drinking and other kinds of excess. And the peasants would go to the great plantations of the uh, medieval lords, and if they didn't get the best food and drink, they'd burn the place down. So it became quite riotous. And it was technically a religious holiday, but the celebration became more and more out of control. There were church services, but then you went and rioted, and you came back into another church service. The established nature of Christianity uh, of Christmas became clear when Charlemagne was crowned on December 25th, Holy Roman Emperor. This is the end of the Dark Ages from 500 to 800, beginning of the Middle Ages, and of the rebirth of civilization. And then in England, in 1066, King William I was also crowned on December 25th. In the Middle Ages, Christmas was characterized by public festivals and pageants and feasting, and it became very much part of Catholic practice. Which is why, when the Reformation came along, the Protestants reacted against Christmas. They considered it to be Catholic, and they wanted to crush it. And of course it was frivolous, and all kinds of things were going on they didn't approve of. In 1647, Christmas was banned by the Puritans, by the Lord Protector Cromwell, who killed King uh, James of not James I, Charles I was beheaded. Terrible thing. Political conservatives still regret that. Don't kill your Not all the water in the deep blue sea can wipe the oil from an anointed breath. Grandma got his. In any case, he banned Christmas. The guy who killed his king would also ban Christmas. And immediately there was pro Christmas rioting. The people didn't want to lose Christmas. They had a wonderful time. So they rioted anyway. Then the restoration, <laughs> right, deeply religious. The restoration of Charles II in 1660, the true king returned, and Christmas returned with him. So all was well. Now in America, the Puritans were even wackier than they were in England, <laughs> and they banned Christmas from 1659 to 1681. Christmas was banned in Boston, together with most of the that time. That was revoked in 1681 when more normal people took over. <laughs> but in New York and Virginia, where you had Episcopalians and not Puritans, Christmas was, had always been very eagerly celebrated. And of course, in the German settlements in Pennsylvania, these are the first people to have Christmas trees in this country, because that's Christmas trees were German, and they love Christmas. After the American Revolution, however, Christmas was considered an English holiday and downgraded, and for a while was not observed at all. Remember, Washington attacked the Hessians on Christmas Day, 1777, here in New Jersey. The Hessians, Germans, were celebrating a very elaborate Christmas, but the Americans, considering it English and German and not American, Washington didn't care. He attacked on Christmas. But in 1820, by 1820, with all this downgrading of Christmas, once we had, we were a free country, didn't care for Christmas, it was English. By 1820, Christmas was in serious trouble. The gentry ignored it completely, and the poor celebrated it in the most riotous excesses. The people, the mobs careening through the streets. Uh, if people didn't give them handouts, they could be strung up. It was a violent and riotous time in New York and in London and other places, and decent people kept off the streets with these drunken mobs all over the place. And peasants in England storming the manor houses as they had in the Middle Ages, demanding food and drink, and if they didn't get it, they burned the house down. So respectable people stayed home. Now this presented a problem to serious-minded Christians, respectable middle-class Victorian Christian people. What do you do? How do you preserve the birthday of the Savior and revive it and reform it and get it out of the hands of these riotous, drunken mobs? Make it respectable, in other words. In America and England, this happened more or less simultaneously. In the 1820s, Washington Irving, a great American author, 
published this, a collection of heartwarming stories of old English Christmases of the past, which may never existed, have existed except in his imagination. And well, that's the way Christmas always is, isn't it? I mean, the family gets together, everybody yells and screams, and Uncle Max gets drunk and falls over and then breaks the Christmas tree, and the dog does what he does on the rug, and everybody, and people get presents they don't want, and then two days later, they, oh, another wonderful family. <laughs> so that's the way our family is on Thanksgiving. Uh, I, I just had wrote a note to my cousin. What a wonderful, happy Thanksgiving in the bosom of the family. As I recall, half of them are Democrats and half are Republicans, and the screaming and the shrieking and carrying on was just wild. But the turkey was good. <laughs> Washington Irving published this imaginary recapturing of, of the Christmases of the past. And everybody read Washington Irving. In 1822, something even more important. The fathers of New York got together. This is the gentry of New York, and they lived in Chelsea near the General Theological Seminary. Still there. Beautiful architecture. If you want to just see old New York as it was in early 20th, 19th century, Chelsea is the place to go, right near General Theological. And the, there's like a cathedral close in there. It's a, it's a garden in the midst of this marvelous old red brick collection of buildings. It's, it's really quite stunning. It's like walking into another century. Clement Clark Moore taught there. His father was Benjamin Moore. They named the paint after him. But he's famous because he was the clergyman who officiated at Washington's inauguration. So he was of the highest New York aristocracy. And a group of these clergymen and Episcopal leaders got together and said, look, we've got to do something to save Christmas. These drunken mobs are parading through the streets. <coughs> Decent people are staying home and doing nothing. We've got to make this a ceremony worthy, a celebration worthy of the birth of Jesus Christ. And so, in a sense, they commissioned him to write the poem for the night before Christmas. And in that poem, you know, it was the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring that even mouth. He invented Santa Claus as we know him now. Except Santa Claus was an elf, because who else could get down a chimney? The Santa Claus in the Macy's parade weighs about 400 pounds. He could get down a chimney. And yet, as a child, I believe he could, because children will believe anything. <laughs> and he was an elf, and that made sense. He also invented the reindeer. the ate reindeer. He also invented the sleigh. And just like Odin, Santa goes through the the sky, checking on the good little boys and girls. So, and of course the reindeer are also from the, the land of Odin in the north. So it's a brilliant adaptation of a very ancient pagan tradition. Santa is this elf that brings presents to the children and fills the stockings. That's 1822. He published it anonymously. He later fessed up and said in 1843 it was his poem. His poem, 18, but it had a tremendous influence in New York in making Christmas a home-centered, not a church-centered holiday. Jesus isn't mentioned in this poem. Church isn't mentioned. Religion isn't mentioned. Santa Claus becomes, you know, if man created God, God would be Santa Claus. That's every human being, God, that they want. As a child, I was a rotten child. It's hard to believe. <laughs> but I knew, whatever I did, Santa was and I'd get my list. And what I did, because we celebrated Hanukkah and Christmas too, and I got a, a present for eight of the nights of Hanukkah, and then whatever I didn't get for Hanukkah, I got from Santa. I was a greedy child and very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I brought up in a house like that. It also was preparing me for my career to teach Judaism and Christianity. I didn't know it at the time. Now, the song doesn't have Santa, so forgive it. Which one? Well, that's, yeah, but that's God. That's, that's like Dama Alecha, Ayan Roer, for Ozen Shabbat, for Kalma Asecha, for Sefer Nechavah, know what is above thee, an eye that sees, an ear that hears, and all thy deeds written in the book. Santa, but Santa brings presents anyway. God now, doesn't. But now, <laughs> we know, but now we know where we wish you Merry Christmas when they demand at the end. We won't go until we get Santa <laughs> right. earlier Those stuff. Those are the mobs demanding the mobs. that the, the, the great lords of the manor give them right. stuff. 
All right, so he invented the modern Santa in that poem, and everybody read it, and everyone loved it, and people be suddenly began hanging up stockings. And it was amazing the impact that little poem had on America. 18th in New York, it started in New York. And when I was at Columbia, there was a professor there, Dwight Minor, who read the night before Christmas, the last day of the fall semester. We got together in the lobby of John Jay Hall, and the fire was blazing, and he would sit by it and read the night before Christmas. And many people still do this in Christmas. 1850, Harriet Beecher Stowe, famous for Uncle Tom's Cabin, wrote The First Christmas in New England. And she documents how Christmas, originally despised by the Puritans, is making a big return, big comeback in New England by 1850. 1856, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow observed that the spread of the family-centered Christmas due to Clement Clark Moore's poem was now all over America. And in 1870, Christmas, which 50 years ago had been almost ignored in America, was now a federal holiday and the most popular of American holidays. Now let's go to England. In England in the 1820s, same problem. A riot of drunkenness and sexual abandon. It, it's the English, when they let go, they let go. <laughs> and people, the, the poor demanding handouts, storming manor houses, chaos and confusion. In the 1820s, Queen Charlotte of Germany married King George III. Well, he, she was already married to him. And she brought the Christmas tree and the domestic home-centered <laughs> celebration of Christmas to England. Not too many paid it, uh, attention until, in 1832, the young Queen Victoria expressed her delight at having a Christmas tree with lights. Martin Luther is given credit for lighting up the first tree. He may have. And she had a very elaborate Christmas tree at Windsor Castle with lights and ornaments and gifts. And she was very popular. And if she did it, everybody wanted to do it. In 1841, now she's married to Prince Albert, also very popular, and he encouraged the custom, the German custom. But many people say he brought the German Christmas tree, the town bound to England. Actually, it was Queen Charlotte, but he made it popular. It spread across England within a few years. Christmas, which had not been a, a home-centered holiday at all, and it didn't get, and there were no presents given to children, and there were no stockings, and none of that. So people began to write. We have all kinds of letters and cards saying we had the traditional Christmas with the, with the tree and the stockings and all, just as we always had. And the people who wrote that had only been doing it a few years. It, it was so popular. It's the greatest holiday anybody ever dreamed of. First of all, the idea of God becoming man, of the infinite becoming finite and eternal, entering into time. And God so loving the world that he shares our human nature. What an idea. But on top of that, Santa Claus and the tree and the stockings and the, and the evergreen and all the rest of it, marvelous. The, the English Christmas is essentially what we celebrate today. Trees like this don't appear in Palestine. This is 19th century England. And my tie is holly and ivy. The holly is you have a, a heart-shaped leaf heart of, of Jesus, the, the red fruit, which is the blood of Christ, and the ivy the etern represents eternal life, the evergreen, which is what he promises. So it's, it's all these symbols are English, but very much in the Christian tradition. In 1848, a sketch appeared in the London Illustrated News of the royal family, Victoria and Albert and the children, around the Christmas tree and the gifts are piled around the bottom of the tree. Everybody wanted that. And it was that was at Windsor Castle, which you always spend Christmas. And within a few years, it was universal. By 1870, the custom had crossed the Atlantic and spread across America. Back to 1843. I have a question, though. The, yeah. the, the image I'd seen of Queen Victoria with Albert was a tiny tabletop tree. It was a tree like this. Yeah. No, no, it was bigger than this. Maybe it was two feet like, higher. Yeah. It was on a table. But it was tabletop. The it Germans kind of liked the big ones. The yeah. English had smaller ones. But now, you know, the bigger the better. Back to 1843. As part of the effort to reform and reclaim Christmas, Charles Dickens wrote the most famous Christ Christmas book ever written, A Christmas Carol. If you want to see the original of it, in his handwriting, it starts, Marley was dead, and you see he made corrections. It's in the Morgan Library on display at Madison Avenue and 
30-something Street, and very worthwhile scene. Charles Dickens wrote a Christmas carol. He made Christmas a holiday of personal reclamation. Scrooge, who rejects kindness and decency, becomes a wonderful old man when the Christmas spirits visit him. It's about moral growth and compassion and charity. It is a secular vision of Christmas. Again, Jesus is mentioned once, as I recall. The child born in Bethlehem is referred to. But it mainly has nothing to do with church. It has to do with how we live at home with our families and our fellow hum uh, human beings every day. So D Dickens also, and Moore, Clement Clark Moore, both updated the ancient images of Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, the elf, in Moore's poem, and the spirit of Christmas present, who's larger than life, he's like a giant with a, a wreath around his head and a robe. This is on the way to Santa Claus. The origin of Santa Claus is Bishop Nicholas of Smyrna, in present-day Turkey. In the fourth century, he loved children. He would go to poor homes and throw gifts in the door for the, for the children, and he became the patron saint of children. And that cult of uh, Nicholas, he became Saint Nicholas, spread across Europe in the Middle Ages. In the 17th century, in England, he became Father Christmas. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's, all, it's also important to note that um, he, he also used to uh, give money to uh, families who had daughters, uh, poor families. For dowries, right? For, Get married. That, for right. dowries, um, so they wouldn't become prostitutes or mm -hmm. slave girls. Very good. Because a woman in those days, you're either a wife or a prostitute. There are new opportunities, ladies, <laughs> in existence. In 1809, 17th century Father Christmas in England. In 1809, Santa Claus was declared to be the patron saint of old New Amsterdam, now New York. New York Historical Society discovered he had been the patron saint. In 1810, he appeared for the first time in a drawing in a white robe and a bishop's, a, a white beard and a bishop's robe. The big cross on Midas. By 1863, they had secularized his clothing. Thomas Nast, the great uh, uh, illustrator of Harper's Weekly, drew him 2,200 times over 25 years, and he dressed him in fur-lined robes. Of course, there was no color in the newspaper, so we didn't know what color it was. He was no longer an elf. Now he's a very large person. In 1920, only in 1920, that Santa Claus robe become red because it was part of a promotion of the Coca-Cola company and the colors of Coca-Cola are red and white. So they made him red with white fur and a white beard. Uh, the decorations of Christmas, of course, the tree of light, which is a male image, a phallic image, the wreath, which is a, a womb image, and you put the two together and you have life, eternal life, new life, and that's what it's really about talked about the holly and the berry and the evergreen, all eternal life. And I said Martin Luther probably because when you exchange gifts, then you turn the lights out. Now, of course, we can have the eternally lighted tree. Uh, the tree of light is such an ancient symbol. And whether it represents Hanukkah or Christmas, the symbol is the same. When we need light to move, we light the tree and hope for the return of uh, spring and life all over. Now, when I, wait a minute, when I was a child, I was, a child, I was a very greedy child, but a very stupid child. And I believed whatever they told me. And I decided, my parents redecorated my room, and they put in a marble mantelpiece with logs with a light under it so that it looks like real logs. Of course, there's no chimney. It was all phony. But being retarded. I didn't notice it. <laughs> and I said, this year I want Santa to come down the chimney in my room. <laughs> and now why was that? Because I wanted to see Santa. My plot was to stay up all night, despite the fact I was 32 years old, <laughs> to stay up all night, I guess I was about six, and I was going to confront Santa and find out why I didn't get the truck that I wanted the last Christmas. I asked for a big one, I got a small one. Well, I was angry. But I wanted to see Santa, and my parents foolishly agreed. 
foolish people produce the foolish stuff. <laughs> now, my father was about my size, he was a big man, and he decided, it, now it's 2 o'clock in the morning, now it's 3 o'clock, I'm not going to sleep. He would come in and check on me. And I felt, I, I remember saying, I'll pretend to sleep by holding my breath. <laughs> so I lay there holding my breath. But he caught on. He realized, and my mother was outside in the hall with a, with a bicycle, and, this thing. and so my father finally, in desperation, lay down next to me. I was against the wall. He, this wide man, lay down next to me, so I couldn't see over him. And while he was blocking the view, Santa came in with the bicycle and all the other stuff, and then disappeared. And my father jumped up and said, "Oh, thank God, Santa Claus came." Here it is, kids. Go to sleep. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> and so my plot to see Santa never worked. But we always put out vanilla wafers and milk for Santa, and of course a carrot for the reindeer. And I began to have doubts about Santa when Johnny Leader, a horrible kid, told me that Santa didn't eat vanilla wafers. He only ate chocolate chip cookies. And I confronted my mother. And I said, you said he ate vanilla wafers. What is the chocolate? She said, that's because the real Santa doesn't come to Johnny Lee. <laughs> Santa's helpers eat chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> we get the real one. And one more story. I remember shopping, Christmas shopping with my mom. She always had an answer for everything. And mother, of course, is always right. We were at 57th Street and 5th Avenue. And there was the Santa Claus with a big red kettle collecting money for the poor, ringing his bell. Volunteers of America. And I threw in some coins and felt very good about myself. Then we went down to 55th Street. There he is again. We got to Saks Fifth Avenue, and by this time my little brain is really strained beyond endurance. And I looked up, I said, Can I see the one up there? Is he jumping ahead of us? What's going on in here? And I said, Mommy, we saw Santa at 57th Street, we saw him at 55th, now he's at 50th Street. Oh, darling, no, those are his helpers, or oh, the ones that eat the chocolate chip cookies. Yes, <laughs> the real Santa isn't here. The real Santa lives at Macy's. <laughs> <laughs>